Good morning, all of you. I'm a control theorist by training. I've worked in uh, different areas uh, in uh, robust control, optimal control. Um, uh, my research has a spectrum of uh, theory to applications, although you know my emphasis has always been in theoretical work, but I've done quite a bit of applied areas. The last decade, I've been interested in network problems, and I've looked at uh, particularly um, uh, risk and cascaded failures and um, how, you, how you figure out from the configuration of interconnections why certain systems are more fragile than others. Um, of course, this is a very important area for the power grid. It's very important for energy systems. But I actually also worked on financial systems and social systems and, uh, and what have you. And the underlying theoretical underpinning really are very similar to understand systemic risk and cascaded failures. But I thought today I'm going to talk about something completely new, an area that I've been working on for the last three years. Um, and so my talk is two parts. First, I'm going to talk about data markets and the importance of data, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this area. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about learning dynamical systems, something which is more connected to um, probably things you know already. Uh, but I think it's an important um, uh, area that, you know, it's an important set of questions that we need to be able to ask and how do we connect um, uh, different fields uh, with each other. So my talk has two flavors, one on the data markets and the other one is learning dynamical systems. I would say the second is more standard, the first is non-standard, so I decided to start with the non-standard topic, okay? So economics of data and data markets and so forth is, uh, is something interesting, and um, um, I'm sure that every day you go to a university or you hear a lecture or you hear a talk these days, the word data gets mentioned. There was a time when we did not mention data that often. I mean, we'd say systems, we'd say, you know, but now data is mentioned almost every day in your lifetime, and if not, more often. And it's become a really important uh, topic. And the question is, so, so how do we deal with this as a field? This is, no, you're not seeing what I'm seeing, OK? And uh, by the way, feel f free to stop me. I have a lot more slides that I can finish. And so I'm not planning to finish them. Or, or I could. Let me go. So this is my collaborators, uh, uh, students and uh, faculty. I'll mention that as we come in. So the first thing I want to say is about computing. Uh, one of the reasons I, I'm talking about computing broadly is that at MIT, we just launched a new college called the College of Computing. We never, never had a college of computing. We don't even have colleges. We have schools. Um, and so we created something called the College of Computing, which is sort of a, 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 a horizontal organization that sits under all schools and all departments where computing is going to be the core competency in everything we do at MIT, okay? So why, what is the importance of computing and how do we, well, computing has become really a very, you know, obviously a very powerful thing, but let's just think about it a little bit historically. If you go back to the 50s and 60s, uh, computing was uh, primarily in large mainframes. Um, you know, people of my age, you know, we, we used to work on VAXs and, uh, uh, cyber systems and so forth. These are very large uh, computational um, computers, and they were extremely helpful in doing a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, computing was became a thing in the 50s and 60s because we were able to simulate very large phenomena. We were able to simulate weather phenomena, financial systems, uh, um, um, air flights, um, airports, you know. And based on that, engineers were able to design interesting decision and control systems, design tools based on them, and so forth. So that's the computing in the, in the, in the 50s. And I would say in the uh, 90s, it became more about the cell phone. This was a large cell phone, but I had one of those, you know. And, um, um, well, you know, it became a little bit more ubiquitous in the sense that you could actually now have mobile communication. You don't have to be in a particular place and so forth. These devices were not as sophisticated. They were primarily communication devices. But then the most recent era, these devices became communication computation devices, and they are embedded because you can take them everywhere. You can, you can compute in your car. You can compute in your house. 
and I don't know where I put my phone, but I can be computing right now as I stand in front of you. The latest part here, that part, generated enormous amount of data that we did not have a decade ago or a decade and a half ago. Data about individuals, it's location driven, it's individual driven, it has a lot of uh, social information, but also it enables real-time decisions, which is something that's really important. Because it enables real-time decisions, now you're able to, I mean, I, I'm telling you something obvious, but I think in, in pondering on it, you see that, that why we are in a different era than we were 15 years ago. Now you sit in your car and you look at your uh, Google Maps or whatever you use, Waze and so forth, and you know exactly what's going on in the transportation system. Because you know what's going on in the transportation system, you make a decision based on that state. So your decisions, and then you make a decision. You take, a, you take this route versus that route. That's a decision. That decision based on the state of the system. What is happening is a very interesting phenomenon here where you are now part of the feedback system. 15 years ago, you were not part of the feedback system. You were an observer of the feedback system. But now you are part of the feedback system. And that kind of changes everything we think about. And it actually kind of resulted in what I would consider a revolution. In, uh, I'm going to kill my wireless because this thing keeps coming up. Okay, let's just skip that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about these applications and see how data has become an important thing. So transportation, con uh, congestion, I don't know. Con there's no congestion in Copenhagen, honestly. I mean, this is a very easy. There is? There is? Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't seen it. It's primarily in bicycles, you know? I didn't see car congestions, but uh, probably true. Uh, but congestion is becoming a, a real thing. You know, more and more people are moving into cities. Uh, there's a certain amount of capacity for roads. You really can't keep adding more and more roads, and the more roads you add, the more cars you add, and so. Uh, and even though we have all of these interesting devices of managing congestion and so forth, it's just getting, it's getting worse and worse. Um, that has done something very interesting to transportation. So uh, transportation used to be a science about designing roads, designing uh, um, stop signs and, and so forth. Actually, people spend a lot of time thinking about how you enter and how you exit a, a highway and where you place the enter, entrance and exit. That was the traditional field of transportation. Now the, now the field of transportation is all about informatics. It has nothing to do with roads. No one is trying to design new roads to, to curb congestions, right? It's all about how do you manage this particular problem through information. So what is the information? Well, first of all, you know, we could actually give everybody um, um, information about the state of the system. So that Google, Google Maps gives you that in real time. So you know exactly where the congestion is and where it's not. Right? We give you a capability of making a decision. We make a recommendation for you right? based on prediction of where traffic is going to clear and where it's not going to clear. But also, we can create incentive mechanisms for you to take certain decisions by, for example, creating dynamic toll. So there will be um, a pricing system that will penalize you for taking a certain way and, and maybe incentivize you to take another way and so forth. So that, that is the, the technology today for dealing uh, with transportation and with congestion. And if you think about that, the whole problem is predicated on the data that we acquire from the transportation system, namely the roads, from you as you go around and, and do your own thing. We actually learn about your own behavior, and we could probably predict what you would do individually in the future and give you a personalized incentive that way. So uh, this is a paradigm shift. This changed the way the field is. I keep talking with my colleagues at MIT is that we should just get rid of all the older faculty in, in uh, civil engineering because none of them work on these areas. Right? I mean, we just have to then just say take early retirement because none of the stuff they do is really helpful. They don't like that, but it's true. I give them good packages. They can be happy retired. 
the power grid, I know that this is a lot of energy system. I know that this is supposed to be about energy systems and so forth. And I'm giving you a very broad uh, set of talks. But certainly the power grid is uh, one important area which is also interesting and um, transforming. I have a lot of stories to tell about power systems. Not all very good. Yeah, but... Um, but power systems, you know, so the one thing that has happened actually, so I have been working um, in power systems, particularly the power grid, for several years, although kind of my interest in that area has gone down a little bit. And so 10 years ago, I thought this is a great area to work on, you know, actually more than 10 years ago now, 2007. I made a decision that, okay, this is a great area to work on because it's going to transform. This is, a, you know, the grid is going to transform. Energy systems are going to transform. Uh, the uh, penetration of renewables is going to create a whole different paradigm of how you deal with, uh, with the power grid. The unfortunate thing that happened in the United States is that that didn't happen. You know, the United States did not adopt any renewables. California has about 20% air, power, air uh, uh, production and, you know, sort of uh, wind production, but that's been there 20% since 2007. And so really, uh, that kind of was very disappointing because we thought, okay, this is a, a, a revolution about to happen, it didn't happen, okay? It happened more in Europe, I think. Uh, it's happening more maybe in China and, and uh, not, not in India, but in China and some other places. In any case, so it was kind of discouraging. But let me tell you a little bit about why I thought this is going to be a great thing. And of course, it's, you're experts in this area, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. But, engineer, but the um, uh, power systems are an amazing engineering system, right? I mean, this is one thing which is designed in a, in a, what I would say is a beautiful way and actually works, which is amazing, right? So it's a supply chain problem, right? You, create, you generate um, power and you transmit it through a tra transmission lines and you deliver it to houses. So it's a supply chain, there's, there's supply and there's demand. And uh, now these days, so in the past, when I used to teach uh, internet, uh, like the layer, layering of internet and so forth, I would give examples to people and say, think about the power system and then explain how the internet works. Now we do the opposite way. Nobody knows about power systems, but people know about the internet. So we say, think about the internet is how the power systems work. So if you think about the internet, there's a huge difference between how the internet works and and, the, and how power systems work. And what is the main difference? I mean, they're all supply chain, right? They're all, they all are basically uh, transmission systems. You, you create something, you transmit, and you deliver it elsewhere, right? What's the main difference between the kind of the congestion and the whole idea of it and the internet and the, and the power system? Storage is a problem. What else? Capacity. Balance. Balance. What does that mean? Supply has to equal demand all the time. All the time. That's like, you know, you're, you're, if you're a, a computer systems person, say, yeah, oh, you know, if, if you have too much supply, you drop packets. Well, drop packets and Copenhagen goes out of power. That's what a drop a packet is. So supply has to equal demand. That's a very complicated notion in every design that you have to do. So how does the power grid do it? How do you, how do you, how do you match supply and demand? Prediction? Redundancy? Reserves? And all of this is true, and it's all cast under a complicated engineering design that works both spatially and in time. So what happens is, say we sit at this node right now. There's a node here that uh, provides us with power, okay? And now it's uh, 10.02, uh, Monday, sorry. Okay, it's Monday. And so for 10.02 on Tuesday, we begin to plan how much energy we need, how much power we need, okay? And then... As a result, we dispatch sufficient generators to provide that kind of power. Two hours before 10.02 of Tuesday, okay, we revise 
our estimates through prediction to see whether we actually close. Do we have sufficient number of, of generators providing what we need for demand? Okay? And so we, as a result, may actually go for the reserve power, may, may dispatch, maybe gas, or something that can be dispatched faster than, say, coal. I don't know what you do in, in Copenhagen here. Maybe you have nuclear power. I'm not really sure what the, you know, no nuclear. Okay. We can't dispatch that. That's always generating. Okay. And then, and then you go to the five minutes. So five minutes before you're actually 10.02, right? And you try to see whether you actually can. Now you're actually doing more estimation, more prediction of how much you need. You have better estimation because you're getting close to the consumption time. And you see whether you have sufficient generation or not. And if not, you actually really rely on reserves. You go to a spot market, electricity spot market, and you start buying electricity like crazy to make sure that you can supply uh, that kind of a demand. Spot, market, electri spot electricity markets are insane, literally. You can go 1,000x in prices over five minutes. That's because also there are some good guys sitting in there trading and speculating, right? And then what happens is you, at the time when you have to deliver the power, you run the whole thing in real-time feedback. And so what you do, you start playing with frequency and, um, you know, with frequency and voltage power levels in order to make sure that you actually supply and demand are equal by adjusting frequency. And, and, and you do this in time, but you also do it in spatia, spatially, and the whole thing seems to work. And as I described it, this system is an engineering system. It relies a lot on Kirchhoff laws, but there are markets in the middle. There are um, capacity markets and there are spot markets that are running inside that loop. Okay? And finally, there are also people. I mean, if you're not using that system, the system is actually pretty robust. Actually, most infrastructure systems are fairly robust if no one is using them, which is a good strategy if you want to robustify a system. Just stop using it. Okay? Well, you can't stop using electricity, but in a sense, you know, a demand response type thing is trying to figure out ways in which to curb your usage of, of the system when the system is stressed. If we can tell everybody the system is stressed right now, stop using electricity, great, then that actually takes away all the pressure on the system. So demand response is something like that. Stop using it when it's stressed, right? So now you start imagining what happens when you have renewable energy. So what, what goes wrong? Well, the first thing that goes wrong is that these predictions go haywire because not only you cannot predict the demand, but also the supply is changing on you. So now you have to predict the demand, but also supply is changing. You're trying to balance everything. So you need a lot more reserve, a lot more cap you know, potentially storage, as someone mentioned, a bit of a problem. The other problem, of course, is that these, you cannot dispatch renewables. I mean, you cannot just shut down. You can sort of slow down wind generators and so forth, but you really cannot dispatch them. So these are generating whatever they're generating, which means that you have an investment problem in terms of traditional generation. Um, that's a long topic I can get into, but that's not really an important issue. So anyway, so the bottom line is that it's not clear that the spot markets now work very well because the dispatching doesn't really work as well. So 2007, I thought, okay, this is perfect. This is a, an area where not only we have to figure out how to do the balancing for stochastic generation and demand, we also have to redesign all the markets. It's a perfect problem for a control theorist. So I thought I'd start working on this problem. Got disappointed that this is not happening, probably die before any changes happen in the United States. I decided I'd move to a different problem. Um, but one thing that is actually kind of... Uh, Coming back, that makes me want to go back and work on this problem, a new paradigm shift is the electrification of cars. So while, in fact, the United States and many countries are not adopting um, a renewable generation, many of them are adopting um, electric cars. Electric cars are adding enormous amount of stress on the grid because they need to charge, and they charge at random hours, not necessarily at night. And so then that, oh, okay, all of a sudden, it can recreated the problem back for us, okay? Now, in, in order for, and you see how I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on this because I know that this is supposed to be an energy lecture, so I want to give it its, um, its fair value. But also, in terms of electrification, of course, what's interesting is that how are we going to manage this problem of increased charging 
uh, during the day or at night or at random hours? Well, I have an answer for this problem, and I think the answer is fairly trivial, right? Every electric car that comes to the system comes with its own solution. It comes with a battery, and battery is a storage component. So not only, you know, yes, we're charging, but we're also adding storage to the system. If we can just manage it, if we can just put our hands on the storage system and play around with the electricity between batteries, we're all set. Because, you know, it's fine, because somebody will have more charge than others. And, and, and so it actually looks like a beautiful scheduling problem. You have a farm of a huge number of small storage, and each one of these storage components exists at a, at a specific state of charge, has a certain objective at a certain hour, and starting from some objective, right? And so it's kind of a very heterogeneous form of, uh, of uh, storage, and I need to schedule it so that everybody is able to get what they want and be able to go home at 5 p.m. Right? That's, that's really the problem I need to do. I cannot do that without people sharing that data with me. One, they have to share the storage with me, and the second thing, sharing the data of what they need to do with this car. Like, do they want to go home, or do they want to keep it in the garage for the day? But they are not incentivized to share that data with me, and this is part of the conversation I want to have today. Why should they share that information with me? What value are they going to get out of it? Is this valuable enough for them to share the data in order to get some, feed, some, some benefit out of this? Okay. Okay, I don't want to talk about financial systems. It's kind of a depressing subject. <laughs> so I'm going to skip that. Um, this is an interesting subject, misinformation. This is completely different than engineering systems. As you see the quote from Abraham Lincoln. Um, misinformation has become actually a really important topic and one where... Um, Understanding misinformation lies exactly at, at the intersection of, of many different topics that are non-traditional. So let me just kind of explain a little bit. I think when we, uh, when the internet became something and social media grew very rapidly, uh, we had this conjecture that things are going to be great because everybody now, well, what, we, what we've done, we democratized information. So, you know, Jaya wants to know what's going on in Iran. He doesn't have to wait for... Uh, the newspaper in Copenhagen to tell him what's going on in Iran. He goes on the internet and he figures out what's going on in Iran. Very easy, right? And somebody here may want to know what's going on in Yemen. You just figure out what, you just find out. And you can. You can actually find out the information of what's going on in Yemen and not necessarily what the New York Times is reporting about what's going on in Yemen. You can actually read Yemenese newspapers. So it's great, okay? So that means now all of us now are extremely sophisticated and very well educated about all the issues of the world. Well, maybe not. So apparently that didn't happen. What happened is that, you know, I don't want to know about what's going on in Iran or Yemen. I want to know what my friends know. And so I go to Facebook and wait for the posts that come through Facebook and say, oh my God, okay, this, I don't know. Uh, yeah, the Warriors lost the NBA Finals or something like that. That's the news I get. So I get the news that my friends have, and uh, I create a bubble around me, and I'm actually comfortable in that bubble because my, they're my friends. I chose them. Well, kind of. <laughs> right? I chose them, and uh, hopefully they share the same values I, I share. And so when I read the news that they, they post, I'm, I'm, I'm happier. Because I read the stuff I want to read. You know, I don't want to read that, oh, Donald Trump has challenged climate, cha climate change, you know. But he said it can go either way. So That was a great statement he made in England. I thought that was beautiful. He goes, yeah, I believe in climate change, but it can go either way. <laughs> it's brilliant. I, I would never have thought of that quote myself, you know. <laughs> so, so I don't want to read about that. I want to read about other stuff, you know. So the creation of bubbles is, is a stronger thing about, than misinformation. So, there's, so political scientists right now have this notion of misinformation and disinformation, right? Misinformation is benign, and disinformation is deliberate, trying to give you the information to sway your opinion. So what Cambridge Analytica did with 
Facebook data was disinformation. They were trying to sway people of certain psychological profiles to um, vote in a certain way, while misinformation could be these bubbles that we created and so forth. So this is an area that is growing uh, in this Institute for Data Systems and Society. This is a, a um, you know, IDSS. We have a, a group that work on this particular problem that come from social science, political science uh, in particular, actually sociologists, and then computer scientists. But why computer scientists? Why do we need a computer? And data, data science, of course, you know, statisticians. But why do we also need computer scientists? One of the important things that we need to change are the platforms in which this information is being delivered. And I think that one, you know, so why was it, okay, so one, one thing I want to say is that, you know, news was always a spectrum between the truth and not truth, right? I mean, there was never, it's never the case that news is a truth. I mean, if you grow up in any dictatorship regime, you know that news is not news, right? It's a spectrum. Some air closer to the truth, and some are fabrications. Remember also the winner's right history? So history is not true. Nothing is true. What I'm telling you is not true. Okay? Uh, a winner's right history, right? And so, and so there's a spectrum, always a spectrum. So you have to always believe that. So, and someone that comes in and says, I have a deep learning algorithm that classify information from misinformation, already is telling you a lie, right? So the question isn't that trivial, right, of what is a true statement and what is not. It's not trivial, all right? So we kind of have to acknowledge that piece first. Second, well, how do we get confidence about the piece of news that we're reading? In general, we, we try to go to the source and see what, what is the source. How did you generate this piece of information? There are certain people or certain newspapers or certain sources that we trust, we trust that they try to tell the truth. They try to tell it the way they see it. It's not about their narrative. It's about the narrative of the place that they picked up the story from, right? And, uh, and so we need to try to understand the sources, or at least the basic principles that allow us to gain confidence in information that we read. Um, platforms can help a lot. Platforms can allow you to to go back to the source very quickly, understand where did this, this piece of information come in? Has it been tweeted by XYZ, or is it something that has been reported by a reputable journalist, and so forth, in any case? So that's why computer scientists are working on these problems as well. And I mean, there's a lot to tell about this, um, and I may get to that when I talk about uh, uh, data in a minute, but that's a very important area, and as you can see, another area where data has become really core to it. So. Very quickly, I want to tell you where the revolution has happened and where it's happening. So back in the days when I finished my PhD, uh, this is where I existed, you know? I was thinking about physical and engineering systems, you know? We design a control system for an airplane, for a space station, for a car, you know? It's like, well, I didn't care about people. I didn't want to know about people, right? It was not in the formula. Right? Machines and we use physics and everything was clean. All right? And then there were other people that I didn't talk to that much that, that basically worried about economics and social behavior and, uh, and they were all about people. And they didn't have any physics or biology to worry about. And we existed in two different worlds, you know? Of course, I mean, you know, I have a lot of anecdotes about how we interacted, but I will tell you that later. Um, uh, but yeah, there was some interaction between us. I think engineers were down to earth, always down to earth people. Um, engineers always ac accepted responsibility when they screwed up. Um, uh, economists never accept any responsibility. <laughs> and that's the brilliance of economists. I remember in 2008 when uh, we had the crash in the, in the markets because of uh, subprime mortgages, Larry Summers, who was at that time uh, an advice, well, he was still exiting as the president of Harvard, um, started explaining to people how, how failures in the financial system happen. And he was saying, well, you know, financial system is a control system. It was on TV, by the way. He said, financial system, he goes, is a control, it's a feedback control system. And so if, he goes, if you hit it with a small perturbation, it adjusts and gets you back to the equilibrium. But if you hit it with a large perturbation, it's like an avalanche, it breaks down. 
And I'm saying, this guy gets paid $2 million a year to say this, you know? It's like, as our undergraduate freshmen know all about the stuff and control theory. And if you ask them, why did the financial market uh, fail? They won't give you a control system argument. They try to figure out why actually it failed. So, so that's brilliance, how you can actually give a simple loop control system story to explain the whole thing and still get paid $2 million. And, and not take any responsibility for what happened. <laughs> anyway, so I'm learning about those guys. They're really smart. And so, so okay, but then, um, <laughs> yeah. So, but then I described to you this whole uh, embedded mobile computing. And mobile computing has actually created something really phenomenal. The people got intertwined with the systems, right? As I described to you, in transportation, in the energy system, in the, in the financial system. I didn't talk about financial systems, but it's true that if you can get bored with this lecture today, you can actually go on your device and trade stock. You can do it, right? And so here's a disturbance, and it's causing some change in, in, in the stock market. And so um, this real-time engagement connected the physical system with the institutions and people. And as a result, now, you cannot really do these things in, in two separate ways. You cannot think about people and incentives separately from designing the actual control system. They run at the same time scale. And so all of a sudden now, we're, we, we have to deal with this problem where the economics, the incentive mechanism, the general equilibrium theory, so to speak, of where stability is happening in the economic market, and what we do with physics and control have to be done at the same time. And that's really hard because, as I said, we have physics over here, but we don't have it over there. You know, so we, you know, if I let people walk around and do whatever they want, we potentially get some chaotic behavior. I'm not really sure how people will behave. If I start providing some incentives or you know, carrots or sticks, so to speak, we start seeing more regulation of people's behavior but at different types of people. Some people are, are elastic, some people are inelastic, some people have money, some people don't have money, right? So I can put in, I can create a dynamic toll for the transportation system, but not everybody is willing to pay, right? Not everybody has the money to pay. It's not, it's not trivial, it has a social implication or social, social issues. Nevertheless, this is really where we are today. If you want to do research or implementation or think about how to design infrastructure or, as I said, misinformation questions or any of the questions I raised earlier, you got to think about these components all at the same time. So how do you do that? Well, uh, it's data that allows you to do that. That's why 15 years ago we couldn't do it. Well, 15 years ago we didn't do it because the mobile devices didn't allow you to to measure and control in real time. Uh, now it allows you to do that and also give you the data. So the data is the thing that will connect all of this together. Okay? And we can measure it for the most part. right? We can get the data for the most part. And I say for the most part because sometimes when you want the data, you cannot get it. Just try to get data from financial institutions and see what you get. Zero. right? Um, and I'll give you situations today, hopefully, if I get there, um, uh, of why people do not want to share their data and why data becomes a, an important commodity. So data is the commodity. It is the thing that is tying all of these things together. Now, you as, I'm assuming most of you are engineers. Any economists, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> okay, those are the smart guys in the room. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, for the, um, well, let me adjust my statement then. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, okay. So, um, so the important thing is that in connecting these three components with each other, how, how do we actually do it? Okay, well, um, the part on the physical systems, we've always used uh, physics and biology and models. We had models that we trusted, and based on these models, we designed what we needed to design. Okay? Based on, uh, for the economics and people, I think people have used principles, certain principles. Okay? I would say equilibrium theory, um, uh, uh, microeconomics, macroeconomics, that kind of uh, uh, mechanism design right? that allow people to think about how to design uh, systems for people and institutions. 
Now when you connect them with each other, they are very different from each other. Yes, you have data about people, you have data about machines, but they're different data. I mean, imagine just in the power grid, you have uh, voltages and currents, and then you have uh, demand, uh, demand and supply and, uh, and what people's interests are and who's neighboring whom and who cares about uh, the environment and who doesn't. How do you take all of these and design a system? So while data is a commodity and it's important for doing this integrated design question, it is not trivial. And just because you have the data doesn't mean yet you have the answers. Okay? And again, I would say running a deep network, deep, uh, deep neural network on this does not mean that you got the answer. You may, but it doesn't mean that you got the answer. Okay. This is also the change in the market today. Here's the explosion of the number of papers published in what people now call, uh, called AI, by the way. I have to make a disclaimer and say, uh, I don't know what the heck AI is, but uh, um, I know what data science is. I know what statistics is. I know what building models is. But what is artificial intelligence? That just become... Um, a name for all of this stuff. Really, we don't have, we haven't really done anything intelligent yet. I mean, uh, <laughs> so to speak, right? Yeah. I mean, most of the algorithms are fairly dumb and they don't know that they're doing what they're doing. Um, uh, it's interesting that AI now actually calls control theory AI. I was just like, wow, okay, you know, what, what we did in autonomous systems, which is a control system, right? Now they call it AI. I'm saying, okay, then I'm, I'm doing AI. <laughs> Perfect. So, I, and I, I didn't blink. I said, I'm, I'm an expert in AI. Um, yeah. And the funding has actually gone insane in supporting research in AI. That's one thing. Uh, revenue after AI. This is revenue. This is not profit. We'll talk about that maybe later. Uh, but the job opening, this is really, I, I don't know if this is the same in Copenhagen, but certainly in the United States, that, you know, if you, um, if you say I've, I'm a data scientist or an AI, I, do, I know how to do NLP, I know how to do deep learning, and what, any one of these guy, things, you get a job, which is great, right? I mean, I mean, you study to get a job, so you get a job, so you need to study this. So everybody's studying this. People have abandoned the rest of the fields. And everybody wants to become an either a data scientist or a computer scientist or an AI expert. Our, at MIT, 65% of our undergraduate declared computer science as, as their major, you know? And um, we, you, we don't admit uh, with majors, we admit broadly, and then they declare a major at the end of the year, and so they all, I mean, essentially, they all wanted to declare um, computer science. Not all of them passed the classes to declare, otherwise they would have. So that's what's happening. Every, you know, nobody cares about nuclear science or uh, who cares, right? And this is the phenomenon that we're seeing. Now, I mean, that's, those are symptoms of a bubble, data science bubble. It will burst. Um, well, yeah, anyway, but I'm not making any predictions of that bubble. I haven't, I haven't um, shorted any stocks on, uh, on that, but anyway. But I'll ask the economist in the room later and see we should, whether we should be. Okay, so, so the bottom line is that, you know, and this is an interesting quote by the uh, um, um, uh, EU delegation to the council. Personal data is the new oil of the internet and the new currency of the digital world. Everybody now knows data is really critical, and that is not going away. Bubbles may be created, companies are hiring too many data scientists, universities are training everybody to be data scientists. That's not a bad thing, knowing how to do uh, hard work with data is a, is a skill that is going to stay. And, you know, I think the question is, so, okay, so, so what is the issue? Why, why am I talking about, what is the market story? You know, I need to get to the market story, okay? Okay, so in, because data is a commodity, commodity has value, so what is the value of data? What's the monetary value of data? If I show you a string of numbers, how much would you pay for it? That's exactly what... Hmm? Perfect, okay. You're ahead of the game. Okay? But, but that's what Bloomberg does. That's what Thomson Reuters do. Those are data companies. They sell you data. You know? And honestly, they have such a hard time selling data. Now, okay, they're both of these companies, they sell functional data. So they sell 
uh, financial data for banks and so forth, you know, that will track, say, GDP, track interest rates. So this is data that they use for, for their operations. So that has value. They can price it they can, in, in a certain way, right? But in general, like, you've got a com Do you know the, the company 23andMe? You don't know. Okay, so this is a genetic company. You actually send a, a, a sample of your gene, and you pay $100. So, so you, you give your data, and you pay for it. <laughs> which is a, a wonderful uh, economic model. Um, and, then, and then they, uh, well, they do give you some rec something back, okay? So uh, they tell you where you were born. <laughs> yeah. um, but they, they can't get it exactly where you were born, so they get a segment of a lot. Oh, you might have been born in North Africa. Mm. Excellent, okay. Um, 23andMe is an interesting model because this is a place where, okay, so in principle, you paid the $100 maybe for the, for the information you got. You can ask, actually, if you have any diseases or, or genetic disease. I mean, if you really want to know, you can ask them. They'll also give you that, but that's another $100. <laughs> it's not the first $100, right? And so, but the model of 23andMe is a data market because you, okay, paid or got paid to provide your data, and you got a service back. The pricing of it is somewhat arbitrary. They could have charged you 50, or they could have charged you 200. They're playing with the price, and they see where the people are willing to, to go, right? It's not, it's not a true value. It's not the way uh, I buy a house in Cambridge, you know? I mean, it's not, it's not that arbitrary. Even, you know, there is a certain set of parameters that determine why I pay a certain amount of money for that particular house, and, and this is sort of a little bit of a hand wavy. One of the problems there that actually also you want to think about as you engage this particular market, because it is a market, is what are they going to do with this data that you gave them? Okay? So in fine print, 23, I got, I got 23, I mean, that's why I know about it. Okay? So in fine print, they, they say um, that we will not use this data against you. I mean, this is kind of like the, the statement in there, which is, which is great. I mean, because I don't want to be, you know, having my data against me. But it was actually not true. It turns out that this is not true. Um, because 23andMe or one other data company, they didn't declare which one, was the, uh, the way they caught the, uh, what is it, the, um, uh, the Northwest um, uh, killer. You know, this is in California. This is about six months ago. So actually, they traced uh, this person after so many years through his, uh, his uh, DNA and caught him. And we all applauded. Of course, we applauded because we wanted this guy to be caught. I mean, that's a good social thing. But they caught him by, doing, by using the data against him, which they said they don't do that. Okay? So apparently, they do, they do that sometimes. Uh, okay? And, and, the, and, the, and the fear, I, you know, you and I should have is... Okay, so I give them the data because I want to know where I was born. I found out where I was born, but they use it to find out that I have a genetic disease. Uh, they sell it to an insurance company, and then my insurance now gets hived. Okay? So even though I paid, I should have been paid, but I paid $100, now I'm paying thousands of dollars for my insurance. Okay? That's a real concern about selling your data, is that how is my data going to be used? You know? And I'll talk a little bit about advertisement market because this sensitivity we don't have, but we do have it when it comes to our genetic data. Um, all of you are familiar with Cambridge Analytica scam, right? And so forth. And, and here I want to make a point that, of course, here data was used in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. Uh, we don't know really that Cambridge Analytica changed the outcome of the election. That we don't know. We know that Cambridge Analytica attempted, played with people's psychology and sent them recommendations and so forth, but we still don't know whether that was actually, we don't have this counterfactual statement that says, if they didn't do that, then the election would have gone the other way. And you have to remember, as, as you think about these things, these experiments are difficult to, to run. Same thing as experiments in, in, the, in the markets, which is different than engineering problems where we actually do know how to run experiments, but you cannot run an experiment with a real market, you know, because you can't test the market and then, and then find out that, oh, is, this, is the market sensitive to this? Let's shock it. Oh, too bad. You know, you can't do that, right? And so this is the kind of a thing where 
statistics have to be done right to figure out how to, how to infer something about the counterfactual, and I think this is a long conversation we can have. Finally, I want to say Equifax is another example. Equifax is a, is a rating company. Rating companies are amazing because they all work in the background. Nobody, you, nobody's really hired them uh, initially, and then they sell the data to banks. So, you, you know, one day you, you're old enough, you want to buy a house, you want to get uh, a loan, all of a sudden, Equifax apparently has made a credit report on you, and your score is 400 out of 700. So I try to figure out, why am I 400? Try to get on the phone with them, see what happens. Um, it's really a, a, some sort of a scam. It's use, it uses your own data without your knowledge, um, and uses any data, and you have no way of corroborating your data, this data. You don't even have a method of checking whether that was a correct data point or not. In order to do that, you literally have to hire a lawyer to actually go back and... and so any time like you have a dis, dis, dispute with the bank on a payment or a, or, a, or a shop with a payment and you don't pay it, even if the shop decided, okay, fine, you know, you're right, Equifax may not. And this will show up in your credit report one day when you want to take a loan. And it's, a, it's a pretty problematic. Well, they had a breach where 150 million records became public, you know? And then sort of, and then this whole thing was going viral. So what does that mean? 150 million credit records are public, right? Maybe my credit record was public, and then I'm just sitting there, oh, what is my credit rec record worth? I don't know, zero? Maybe nobody cares. But someone must care about 150 million credit records. Someone must care, right? What is the dollar value to that breach? We don't know, right? So as we talk so much about this data being commodity, so this data is so valuable, we never are, we're not unable to put a dollar value next to it. And I think that's a challenge that needs to be taken care of as we continue to treat data as... Uh, as uh. So that's why we have to start thinking about designing a marketplace. And this talk is, is true about economics. It's not a talk about uh, blockchain or, or security or a, a marketplace where you can, you can get the data, but no one, no one knows that you got the data. It's, it's, it's truly about econ economics, right? So I want to give an example. OK, I'm going to do give you a break in a minute. OK, but um, let me give you examples first. OK? Um, one beautiful example about how your data is used is uh, the advertisement market. Does everyone know how the advertisement market works? The, the uh, digital market. It's about a hundred billion dollar market. I mean, I'm older than all of you. If 10 years ago someone came and told me there's going to be a hundred billion dollar market based on advertisement on browsers, <laughs> I would probably just laugh for an hour. <laughs> like it's like th that this person has just lost his mind. Right? But it's true. Okay, and this is how it works. And it works really in, in, a, in milliseconds. It's a powerful market. It's interesting. Here's how it works, okay? So I go in on a, a publisher. So I open a website. Like I open... Uh, Google, or I open uh, New York Times, or whatever. So what happens is that as soon as you open a website, you may not know it, but uh, if I open a website and she opens a website, we see different things. We don't see the same thing, right? There's usually a, a, a certain real estate on the front page that is up for the advertisers to use. And the way it happens is that, okay, so I open up the, the publish, you know, a publisher, a website, and the website now goes in and say, okay, who wants to put an ad in there? Request. Who wants to put an ad in there? So all these ad companies start bidding on that piece of real estate. Okay? You know, so car company, shoes company, book companies, Amazon, everybody is bidding to try to, project, to give something for me. But the point is that, I mean, it can be random unless they know something about me. Okay, but they do know something about me because at the same time, when these guys are asking for the bids and they're bidding, there is a data management platform that basically was tracking my data from the past. 
This is through my cookies. They drop a cookie, they collect the data. They don't even know what I'm typing. I mean, they don't know everything. It's like, oh, uh, privacy. What privacy? I mean, they know what I'm typing. So you, they see you through the camera, know what you're typing, you know? <laughs> it's like, what else do you want? <laughs> Here's my credit card. You know, you might as well buy yourself a cup of coffee. Um, so they got this data, right? All this data about you. Then they advertise us and saying, okay, we need to start bidding, but we need this information. So this information is sold to them. This company, by the way, the data, the, the DMP is collected the data for free, okay? And then they sold it to these guys. These guys now get the data, and based on that, they start bidding. They use second price auction and complicated auctions to win that particular um, real estate uh, value. Once they say a company gets it, gets the real estate, now they need to know what to put in it. So maybe they, a book company won. Now they want to see what book to put in. They use even more of this data about me to know what I like and what I don't like, and then they project that. So ultimately, this ends up being a targeted, a targeted advertisement. Nothing happens until I click on that ad. Once I click on the ad, everybody gets paid. You know, money goes around. It's really interesting, right? And so, and so, this is a market. But what is interesting about it is all about the. It's all predicated on my data, and I'm not even part of it. Like I have no decisions whatsoever about what data they use, how they use it, how they project. I click, and stuff happens. Okay, and so that's that's. We have a baby market that we're creating at MIT. Uh, so let me tell you two things that are really important here. One is I feel a little jaded in that I'm not involved in the data tracking. So they take, yes? So, so if, uh, if you do data protection, you have more laws in Europe? Yeah. So, um, so my question is when, so I mean, the data being tracked, that's, that's absolutely true, but at least now we have to put consent that the data is shared. Um, usually this pops up as a large um, indestructible something that we have to declare that the data is being shared or that we consent on being the data shared. So even if the data is shared, at least we have said that it's yeah. fine. So yeah. That's true in Europe. It's, yeah, it's not true in the U.S., <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not true in a lot of parts yeah. of the world, but it's true in Europe. I mean, so, yeah, the GDPR protections for yeah. their data, which is a good thing, allowing people to have ownership of their own data. Yeah. But in many parts of the world, this is not true. So this yeah. market is maybe destroyed in Europe at some point if people yeah. don't give enough consent. But I don't know if people are giving consent or not. I, that I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they, people they, are. They click so it goes away. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, so, so that's a good point, right? I mean, uh, there's a question of privacy laws and how privacy laws can affect these digital markets. Um, so we, but let me kind of say, so the one problem with this is that, of course, that problem you just mentioned, that the data have been tracked without my consent, but maybe there is a consent and people don't really care enough about it. The second thing is that the data companies that are selling to demand-side platforms also, these guys are not getting a good deal in the sense that the data companies are selling them this data without any value assessment, right? They pay, uh, so Nielsen will sell this data, say, to, to these other companies, that, the DSPs, but they sell them in volumes, you know, in terabytes. You pay per terabyte, right, or, or megabyte or something like that. You don't pay for the value of a particular data set, right? So they're actually paying maybe sometimes more money than they should. They're not really fine-tuning this sort of thing. So we decided maybe our baby uh, game, before I get to the larger one, is to design the system. We call it Zorro. Okay? And Zorro, basically, if you download it in your machine, right now it's pretty functional. We're going to try it out at MIT and see how that works. You, if you download Zorro, then Zorro grabs all your cookies and prevent anybody else from looking at that data. So what you would do for Zorro, you would specify up front once, once, what you're comfortable with. Like what information you would like to share and not share. This is like a survey. 
takes about 30 seconds, and that's it. You never really engage this again. So what happens is that Zorro now decides what part of your data can be shared and cannot be shared. But otherwise, Zorro has the data, has your data, and has everybody else's data who have downloaded Zorro. Okay? So the same thing happens. I go to the, to the publisher. There's an ad request. They come to the DSPs. Now the DSPs want data to figure out how to do the auction. Right? They want my data to figure out how people should auction for their real estate, for the, for the web real estate. But they don't have that data to buy directly. They have to buy it from Zorro. Before, they bought it from Nielsen in terabytes. Now, it's going to be very different. They're going to be querying Zorro about me in, in particular. Okay? And we're going to tell them, yes, here is the data that you can get from Munzer. And here is how much it costs you for that one person. Here's one. It's going to be maybe a penny, a cent, $10,000. I don't know. It depends on if this person is a, is a, is a buyer, is a, is a response to advertisement, is somebody who is a web uh, you know, sort of guru. You know, it depends. And the question is that this, what, how it depends is the technology that we're going to provide. Okay, and the technology we'll provide, I will talk about it quickly now, but we'll come back later, is some sort of a, an assessment of the value of data. Okay, so how do we do this? I'm going to just kind of hand wave this, and then we can, we can come back maybe later. Okay, so are you all familiar with this Netflix uh, challenge that came out about 10 years ago? Raise your hand if you're not. Okay, so let me tell you that quickly, okay? So the Netflix challenge, you know what Netflix? Yeah, okay. Yeah, just checking. So Netflix challenge, is, is a it was a nice problem, right? So there was all these customers, okay? Sorry. So here there was customers, and here we had movies. Okay. So what happens is that you have, say, customer one, maybe watched movie three. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna movie A. I'm gonna put different numbers. Okay, and had given it a a ranking of one to five, maybe given it four over here. This guy may have watched something and give it three, let's give it five, let's give it two, and so forth. Okay? So different people have seen different movies and given it, given it different ratings. Okay? And the interesting question that we want to know is, what would uh, customer number two, how would customer number two rate this movie? They haven't seen the movie. We're trying to predict how they would rate that movie. So you can imagine this is a very high dimensional data set. You could probably talking about you know, 10 million customers with over 10,000, 20,000 movies and a very sparse matrix. If only very, you know, much fewer customers have seen many of these movies. And we want to fill up this matrix. Okay? That's really a key idea because if you know how to fill up this matrix and you're accurate, then you have predicted how people are going to perform. And if you know how to predict people's performance, you can definitely make recommendations and be very successful at it. Okay? And so that's the, what's called the matrix problem. And the simplest technology that we can provide is to do this value of information exactly like the matrix problem. So here now, Zorro has all the data, right? It has all the users from that, that have downloaded the Zorro. And there have been thousands of ads, okay, that may have been presented to them, and we've seen whether they've clicked or not. Okay? And now we have the sparse matrix, and we need to do a sparse completion. Okay? And then we have a metric for how to evaluate the incremental value for this, for this guy. So basically what happens when they query uh, information about this user for ad J, we do the prediction and we evaluate how much value you get by having this data set. How much more information 
this company is getting by having this data set and we charge them for that information. Yeah. So that's an interesting question. That's what we're trying to experiment with right now, right? So um, we are going to try to give a, a fair value and uh, they can say, no, we don't want it, but then they don't get the data. Right? So that's the, so we, so the part, the nice thing about Zorro as a structure is that we now own the data. We are going to provide all of our algorithms, make it transparent for how we're pricing the data. And then if they say no, they don't get the data. Now we have to see whether they actually hold their grounds or not. It's a good question. Newton is getting before. So that's the, the relationship between the browsers and Nielsen, right? The browsers don't want to get, play with data, right? And so they drop the cookie, and automatically the cookie sort of collects the data, goes to a cloud, and Nielsen has that data. There's no, I mean, there are no, there's not many comp competition. Data companies, Nielsen, Bloomberg, a few of them. Yeah. yeah. Zorro is going to be a competition. But Zorro will be by choice. When you download Zorro, you're telling everybody, I am going with Zorro. Because you didn't choose anybody before, right? So this will be by choice, and you specify your specification, what you think is in and what's out. Did you get something back? You get the pay. Okay, you get the pay. Yeah. Zorro gets nothing. Zorro is, a, is like is a, is Zorro. Is a, is a good person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's an interesting point, right? So... So some argument has been, and this is a, a, another interesting economic question, is that browsers are saying, we provided you this, this service for free. This is, the, this is what we get in return. We get your data. And what we're trying to establish is if, this all, if all of this is equitable, right? There's a $100 billion market out there based on this advertisement. It's not clear that that is actually comparable to the value of the free search that they've given you, right? And so we need to get to a point where we understand that balance. I'm not saying it's automatic, but, but we need to kind of get to that point. It's a good point. Anyway, so let me just keep going. This is sort of what we call the baby market, and uh, we're going to deploy in... Uh, we're going to deploy uh, soon at MIT, and, and we'll be able to answer some of these questions that you raised, at least in, uh, in the next few. Okay. So uh, before I, I let you go on a break, I want to introduce the, the kind of the real thing and what I give, sent you papers for, and then, uh, and then we'll, um, we'll break. Okay. So, but in general, there is need for understanding how a two-sided data market work. Okay. And at, what is a two-sided uh, data market? Let me tell you what it is first and then come back and... Uh, uh, I'm going to do his here, okay? Here is, here is a, a, a picture of a, a two-sided data market, and I'll come back and tell you some of the examples where this works, okay? So, so there are sellers for this. So basically, I, ha I need to create a market for two types of people. There are sellers of data, and there are buyers of data, okay? A seller of a data is any one of you, any one of us, any company, anybody that has a data set that would like to get some money for it or some value for, okay? At this point in time, I want you to think that I am selling my data. I have no interest in the objective of the buyer. I don't care what the buyer is trying to do with this data. I'm just trying to sell data and make some money, okay? Maybe I'm a data company, maybe I'm not, okay? So those are the sellers, and the buyers are coming to buy data, okay? Now that's already a bad statement that I just made. A buyer coming to buy data. But if you look at data, there's no intrinsic value. What are you trying to buy? What do you want to buy? I mean, if you buy a cup, you know what you're buying. But buying data, you don't know what you're buying. If you're buying music, you know what you're buying because that has context. And that's where we have raised the first question here of how to frame the, this market. A buyer should not come to buy data. A buyer should come to buy some value. Okay? They should be coming to say, I, you know, they should be coming with a task, a very specific task to say, I am interested in prediction. I'm interested in, so, so I'm a logistics company, for example, and I would like to estimate the, uh, 
um, the, the uh, maybe the sales of uh, jeans uh, for the back to school season in September. That's my interest. So I want to know how much inventory I should have for jeans of a certain kind for September. That's what I'm interested in. Okay? So I'll come to the market and say, give me your best prediction for this particular task. Why is that important? Why is that different than buying data? Well, of course, first of all, I don't know what data is useful to me for making this particular prediction. Right? I mean, there could be a broad set of data sets that could be valuable. The second of all, I know I can quantify the value of this prediction. If you give me 10% improvement in, in the prediction of how much inventory I should have, I can tell you exactly how much cost I cut from storage. I can, I can translate that 10% improvement into a dollar value. All of a sudden, now we have a way to track the value of the data. You're coming to buy something where every percentage improvement translates to a dollar value. Okay? So now we know the value for the prediction for you. Seller wants to sell some data. Market has to make this work. Okay? And then all of a sudden, now we have a, a, a problem to solve. Okay? So that's the setup that we have. Sellers don't care about the buyer, they just want to make money. Buyers come in with some tasks that they're trying to predict, okay? And then the market is trying to make this work, okay? Well, how, what is the idea of the market? Well, of course, a, a seller, sorry, the buyer is interested in, in this task. They, they have to put some money down for the data sets. Depending on the amount of money they put down, they get more or less accuracy of the data sets that they have. So how is this done in a way that makes sense from an economic perspective. Is the, is the sort of problem not so clear, but at least generically sort of makes sense? Yeah. Uh, with this uh, figure, it looks like that the seller's function before and after data selling is the same, and it will not be affected by data selling, right? And the data will not be used again. So yeah. there's a true. So yes. if you like to add kind of big bag, we can show that okay, the seller's function will be different. So I think we extra yeah. loops or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that the, so that's the the question of uh, how the data is used against you is is dodged in this question here. Agreed. So I'm going to come back to all of these differences, but that that's definitely true. Yeah. Any other questions? Are you incentivized? That's a good question. Let me, let me describe the model and how it's going to work, and then we'll see whether it actually makes sense for you to do that or not. So this is a, there is part of the, part of the uh, analysis of creating a market like this is incentives for people to game the system. So one thing that you want to make sure is that people are not gaming the system to make more money or less money or prevent other people from making money. Is another question. Same question. Okay. All right. So we'll get there. Yeah? Uh, if I'm coming with a predicted task, uh, how, how would I know that the quality of prediction is improved until they even happen? Okay. That's a good question. So you need a, a way to benchmark that. Right? So every time we have a prediction task, we either can have two things. One is either... Um, um, a test data, or we can actually wait to see if the prediction is correct, and then do the retroactive payment after the prediction is happening. Uh, oh, I mean, this is this is not easy. <laughs> this is this is not something you're going to just be able to deploy. I'm just trying to kind of, kind of create the principles of what allows us to create a market. It's going to be complicated to actually implement this particular market, but, but right now it's just trying to understand what, where the principles are. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, you can poke holes all over the map. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a data provider storing a prediction and creating some value, uh, how should that value be split between the uptake of that value or the use of that data and the provider? Okay, good, good. So it's coming up. So hold that question. I mentioned the transportation example before. So you can imagine now that uh, sellers of data could be, so buyers of data, first of all, could be 
municipalities, cities, states, they're all interested in uh, doing uh, better predictions of, uh, of uh, traffic because better prediction will mean that they can actually either allocate capacity or change uh, um, control and incentives in certain ways. So uh, the buyer will be somebody buying, interested in buying accuracy on congestion at a give different times of the day. Sellers will be just about anybody else, right? It could be uh, um, uh, the taxi industry, the bus industry, or the corporations running these things if they're not state-run, um, uh, individual people, um, you know, and so forth, right? I mean, that all can be sellers of data that could be relevant, but other data could be also more relevant. So, for example, you know, maybe Twitter data could be relevant. Uh, information about uh, games and activities in the city could be relevant because all of that can have impact on the prediction without knowing a priori which one is more predictive and which, which data set is more valuable than the other data set. And the market would then have to sort of figure out how to do this matching between the data for the sellers and the buyers. For the smart grid, uh, the different places where data markets can exist, um, the problem I mentioned earlier about the uh, electrification of cars, I think there's a data market for, um, uh, there's data, there, so what's going to happen, as I said, is that the storage, there will be a storage market where people are essentially uh, kind of offering their batteries to be part of a farm. So there's a storage market, and that market is predicated on a data market on top of it that describes the interest and the and sort of the habits and the real-time changes of these habits of individual uh, uh, sellers, of individual users. And of course, at that time, probably one of the buyers will be uh, utilities and uh, ISOs and companies that are managing the electricity. And the same thing in advertisement market. Okay. Another comment I wanted to make. Okay, so a couple of things about why is it that markets for data are different than regular markets, okay? And just kind of to keep some of these things in mind. One important piece is replication. So the, the point is that data can be replicated. You can, you can sell the data to multiple people. You cannot sell a house to multiple people. You cannot sell a stock to multiple people, right? The same stock. Okay, but you can sell the same data to multiple people. And because of that, there is a connected, um, okay, there's a connected point to it, which is the value, uh, what economist, economists refer to as externality. So, you know, so the point is that I may like a data set, but my interest in that data set drops because you sold it to somebody else. Right? And so if I, I think of that myself as a hedge fund, it's more important for me that I get the data alone, you know, not to share the data with other people. So, um, so yes, the seller can multiply the data and sell it for multiple people, but the value of the data could be changing as they change the number of replication. But you see that that's very different than any regular commodity, and as a result, very quickly... Um, uh, the, the way to quantify the value a data set can provide becomes a combinatorial problem, okay? Combinatorial in a lot of different ways, right? And so, and so that is a complication in running a market where the goods are becoming, in a way, very quickly combinatorial in nature. So how do you do these things in real time is, is a question. Um, in, the, in the way I describe the market, the sellers were selling data, buyers were coming to buy some uh, value for a task, these tasks can be very different from each other. You know, somebody can come and buy a task for prediction, uh, for inventory, somebody is trying to buy uh, um, a prediction for traffic, somebody is trying to buy prediction for storage, uh, and so forth, right? And there may be different buyers. The tasks can come from different distributions. They can be very heterogeneous in nature. Uh, so this is very different. And then authenticity and the value is something that we have to worry about and then this externality that I described earlier. So these things are, you know, make a, reg a regular market sort of inappropriate to think about for a data market, and then, you know, and so maybe it's worthwhile thinking about real markets, okay, just for a second to understand what's going on, okay? So we have a market that we all understand, and that's the stock market, okay? Well, we kind of understand, really, okay? But a stock market, you buy and sell stocks, and the value of the stock, by and large, is decided that day 
based on metrics that have to do with the company. Okay? Supply and demand obviously gets into the picture, but the supply and demand presumably is dictated by the revenue generated by the company. Okay? So there is a... Um, there's a simple way, in principle, where you're valuing the stock. You're not discovering the value. You come to the market. I want to buy, you know, um, you know, two, a hundred, a uh, hundred stocks from Apple. Apple is priced at ninety-one dollars. You, you, you pay this amount of money and you get your stocks. Okay, it's very simple. There's no price discovery per se. A, an asset, which is the stock, has a value and is determined in a particular way. That, that presumably makes sense to everybody, right? And, I mean, of course, the market has, has issues, but that's how you do it. Um, the ad market that I described area, uh, earlier, so this is, first of all, okay, that's a real market. It's a real asset market. Assets can be sold only once. They cannot be replicated. If you replicate a the stock, then you drop the value by half. Um, that's when, when companies issue more stocks and, and so forth. Um, but it doesn't have any of the character. It's not a combinatorial problem per se. You know, I don't come in as a buyer to buy a different kind of value than the value of the stock itself. It's a very simple market. Okay? The ad market I described to you in all details. And it, again, even though it's a digital market, it doesn't have the problem of selling data because what is going on is that I'm selling at the end of the day the piece of real estate on the browser. That cannot be replicated. Can, that cannot be sold to multiple people, right? So at the end, we're putting a value to it. The whole exercise of going through auctions and, and pricing is only to put a value. So there's a little bit of a price discovery there, but certainly we don't have... It's, it's much simpler price discovery um, technique. And then there are markets called prediction markets. I don't know if you're familiar with those. So these are markets that are used... Um, to predict outcomes of uh, games, outcomes of elections. Uh, is Brexit going to happen or not? And the way it works is fairly simple. What you do, you have a certain amount of money, um, small amount of money, and you, you put that money in the market by assigning a probability to different outcomes. So suppose the outcome is going to be Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. You say, okay, 70%, 30%, and you put a certain amount of money, like a dollar, you throw a dollar to, to enter the market. What happens at the end, when the winner is, is declared, you get paid or not paid depending on where the highest probability. So in this case, I would not get paid. I lost my dollar because I said 70% Hillary Clinton. Someone who bet on, on Donald Trump will actually get money back. So it's a market. It's a data market, right? It's a very simple data market because it doesn't really ask... Any questions about how I came up with my prediction, I input my prediction, okay? And it has, I mean, you can prove some theorems, assuming that if everybody has the same source of information and so forth, then this could actually be a, a way of crowdsourcing information to make a better prediction, okay? It's a crowdsourcing uh, technique. It's very different than the market I'm describing. It doesn't have a seller. It doesn't have a buyer, per se. It's a data market of some sort, but it's a very different type of a market. But it actually exists and has been proposed as a way of thinking about different types of problems anyway. I mean, it's a, it has an interesting uh, implications to it. So anyway, so that's the market I described. I've given you the logistics market, so I'm going to move on and tell you what, it, what needs to be done and very quickly fly over how we did it. Okay. So what are the issues? The first thing is that, um, as I said, there are sellers, there are buyers, and the market has to decide how to do this. So how is the market, what is this, what is it? What is the market going to do, okay? So I'm a buyer, okay, and I came in with a task. Let's just keep thinking about this logistic company of trying to predict the inventory in September. That's who I am. I'm coming in to predict the inventory. So I'm coming with this task. And I need to bid for data. So I come in with this task, and I come in with a bid, okay? So I have to come up with some sort of a bid over here. And the market needs to figure out, if I bid a certain amount, what data will it give me? It cannot give me all the data every time. If I bid infinite amount, then it gives me all the data. If I bid zero, I get no data. And somewhere in the middle, I bid a number, I get some data, okay? So the market has to decide the data it's going to give me based on my bid. Once it has given me the data, 
we compute the prediction, okay, based on the data. We evaluate the prediction based on either uh, uh, a test set or the future of actual realization of it. And based on the evaluation of the prediction, I have to pay. Because I, I, I got this data, I got this value, I have to pay. I pay the market a certain amount of money. So the market have to decide how I pay, what I pay, based on this prediction. You see, you're clear on that, right? So first, I, it has to decide what to give me, okay? So it has to decide on what data to allocate, okay? And then it has to decide how much payment I have to pay, okay? Now, what are the issues? And then once I got, okay, so when I decide how much I have to pay as a buyer, I pay the market, the market takes this money and have to give it to the sellers. How does it give it to, how does it divide it by this, divide it to the sellers? Do they all get equal amounts? Maybe they don't deserve equal amounts. Maybe some data sets were much more interesting and better for the predictions than other data sets. So the market somehow has to figure out how to divide this money among the sellers in a way that captures the contribution of each seller. So the market has to do a lot of different things, right? And if the bid, if the allocation of, if the allocation of data based on a bid is going to be on, on some prices, then the market needs to create a pricing for these data sets and continue to update it from one step to the next step. So what we're proposing is an algorithmic market, a market that will discover the price of these data sets, continue to update them over time in such a way that somehow revenue is being maximized. Okay, so let's kind of drill a little bit deeper and see what happens and see if we... Uh, the point is, though, there are a couple of things that we need to sort of worry about, and I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so let's just kind of give some symbols, although the symbols are really not that... Uh, ooh. Got confused here. Okay, so X is the data that is being sold, okay? And there are going to be, um, each one is a feature. Think of it as a vector of RT dimension, it doesn't matter. So every data set is a, is, a, is a vector of dimension RT, and there is going to be M data sets, okay? So this, this is what the sellers are. And for this particular formulation, I'm assuming that the data sets are going to be fixed. So... So it's going to be a dynamic market, but the sellers are the same for this formulation. It doesn't, this is not general. General. It's not general. It can be uh, extended. Okay. And then I'm going to assume that the buyers are going to come one at a time. Okay. So one buyer at a time gets what they want, leave the system, and then the next buyer comes in. The buyer N comes in. Okay. Again carries a, predict, a task that they want to predict, call that variable yn. So that's the inventory in September. Again, it is a feature of dimension t, okay? And also when they come in, they have a valuation we call mu n. What's the valuation mu n? Mu n is the amount of money they make for every percentage improvement of the prediction. This is the cost cutting, you know, so this is the knowledge, a hidden knowledge that they don't declare, you know, this is their valuation of the accuracy. Every percentage accuracy saves me mu n dollars. So think of this as a linear type um, uh, function, okay? So they have mu n, so every, every buyer has mu n, is trying to predict y n, but they will offer a bid of b n. Okay, BN is the amount of money they're going to bid at the market. Now, a truthful bidding in economics is when the bidder bids exactly their valuation. That's when BN is equal to mu N. But the question is, can you set up a mechanism so that you are incentivized to bid your valuation? This can probably sound Chinese if you haven't seen it before. Is, it, is everybody familiar with... Yes, go ahead. It's different, right? So I have to exactly give you exactly what I mean by bidding. I have to do that, right? Because it's not clear what you're bidding on. 
You're, you have multiple data sets. What are you bidding on? So I'm, yes. So right now, one person is coming into the system, right? And as I said, again, this is a simplified scenario. Data sets, there is M data sets for sales, but one person comes in at a time. If there are two people coming at a time, I have to adjust all of this. Okay? All right. So, um, but uh, are people familiar with auction or second price auctions? Okay. So, second, uh, so just for information, second price auction is a stable auction mechanism, right? Why? Because you are actually incentivized to bid your true valuation of what, whatever you're bidding on. So there you're bidding on one thing, a bunch of people are bidding on one thing, they say a house, they value this house in different ways, okay, they all bid, and then the highest bidder gets the house but pays the second price. Okay, and the point is that with this particular mechanism, everybody is incentivized to bid exactly their valuation. So what does that mean, and this is why they got the Nobel Prize for this, is that this is a very clever way of having the, seller, the buyer, in this case, the buyer, declare their valuation without asking them for their valuation. I don't ask you to give me your valuation, decide who gets the house, you bid your valuation because the mechanism forces you to bid your valuation. So what you need for faithful bidding in general is a mechanism to make you bid your valuation without anybody asking you for your valuation because that's private information. Okay? So that's the important thing, but in general, you bid BN and you have a valuation mu N. Okay? Continue. Okay. All right, so these are symbols that uh, describe all of this, and uh, nobody's going to remember that, so it's not really important, but... but but I want to say it because the, 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 the concepts are important. So the first thing that we have to, so I'm going to just tell you what it is and then, and then plow through it. The market is going to set up prices. It's going to set up price for every data set. Okay? So there's going to be a vector PN. Okay? That's the, the market price set up, the, mar the, the, mar the price that the market sets up for every data set. And then it's going to continue to update the, those prices. So every time a buyer comes in, we use the prices. The, price, the buyer exits. We update the prices, okay, based on what happened with that particular buyer. And hopefully this update mechanism discovers intrinsic value for the data sets, okay? And we're going to do this without making any probability distribution assumptions. We're going to do this entirely on algorithmic uh, basis, okay? So that means that we have a way to update the prices going from the previous prices to the next pricing. That's an important mechanism the market is doing, okay? YN, we talked about it. That's what you want to predict. BN is the bid that the buyer is going to put in. Um, there is a the feature and data is the same here, okay? So, so the the once you make a bid, the market allocates data for you or features for you. So that's a function from, that depends on the bid and the price. Okay? And then what happens is you have to pay a certain amount of money. So there's a payment function, P. That's how much you pay back to the market after you re receive the data and the value from the data. Right? Because you received a value as a buyer, you have to pay the market some amount of money. What is that amount of money that you pay? And then we take that amount of money and we distribute it to the, buyer, to the sellers and I need a, uh, a partition function to tell me what fraction of that money gets to each, uh, each buyer. All of this have to be designed for this market to work. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so the first thing is... Um, <laughs> Actually, the first thing is to talk about the payment function, okay? So the payment function, uh, and, and the analogy here we want to do is, um, and so, uh, by the way, you know, when I think about this, I'm not going to get into the detail of every one answer here, but I'm going to give you the system level answer. All the pieces that will, in principle, create a market, okay? And then we can spend all the time in the world figuring out whether each piece is actually the right one or not, okay? So the first thing I want to, emphasize is the payment function, okay? In the second price auction, there was a payment function. What was the payment function? It's the second price, okay? Not the highest price, but the second price. That was easy because it was one commodity, 
and there were multiple bidders on that one commodity. Here we have a situation where you are bidding on any possible, so what happens is I, I'm going to bid a certain number, but then based on that, any possible combination of data sets could, could have been given to me. Okay? So there's a combinatorial set of options for the market to allocate to me for the price that I asked for. Okay? So I need to kind of sort through these combinatorial options, uh, 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 combinatorial choices, Right? And this was covered in Morrison's payment rule. If you're not familiar with that, I'll show you in a second. So what is the payment rule? Essentially, it's this picture. Okay? You have a payment function, a bidding function, which is the, just a scalar. Okay? And based on the uh, bid, you have a certain prediction output, you know, a, a certain allocation and a certain prediction output. What you pay is the marginal value. Okay? You don't pay all the value that you get from this allocation, but you get, you get the, the marginal value for increasing your bid from BN to BN double prime. Which means that in general, you're getting the, you have to pay the curve, this, the, the area above this particular curve. It's a, this is, a, if you've seen this before, you will recognize why this works. If you haven't seen it before, it's going to take some time to figure out why this is interesting. Okay, So I'm not going to spend time doing that. All I'm going to say is that if you use the payment function, Myerson's payment function, then all the bidding will be truthful. Okay, The bidder now is maximizing their utility. What is their utility? It's what they get minus what they pay. Okay, What they get minus what they pay. If you look at that quantity, maximize it over the bid, the bid coincides with the valuation. Shadow price. But it's a, it's a, uh, uh, the, the, in the design that we have over here, it's just a, a scalar. So I don't have a vector of price uh, of, right, okay. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Good. So, so Myerson's payment rule. Um, as I said, you know, it's something that you can just put a note there and say, Google Myerson's payment rule. And when you Google it and you get that for free, um, you know, you can figure out exactly what that is. I mean, we, you know, really it's not time to talk about it. Okay. So, um, and then, okay. And, and so, and so then the, uh, the way this mechanism is going to work is that um, you are allocated, a, so if you bid BN, you're allocating, uh, allocated a number of, um, so as I said, okay, so now remember the market is going to start with a bunch of prices for the data sets. I'm going to allocate a number, I'm going to bid a number, and then what the market is going to do is going to allocate all the data to me where the price is less than the number I bid. Okay, so it's a very simple mechanism. I bid in 50. Every, every data set that is priced less than 50, I get. Okay? And that sorts through all the combinatorial problems by a linear relationship. It's just an assumption. It's just a method that we're proposing. And in fact, that turns out to work really well. So that's the allocation function. And then... Um, so let me... I'm going to skip all of this, okay? And just get to the bottom of it. Okay, so what I've done is I've done a couple of simple things. I said um, there's a pricing, there's an initial price for every data set. You bid, you get allocated everything that's below your bid, and now what you do, you pay back the Myerson's payment function, and then you exit the system and a new guy comes in. Okay? Ignoring the market paying the, buy the sellers, a person comes in, and now what we want to do is redesign the prices to maximize revenue based on the previous exercise. This is called online optimization. Online optimization, it's online optimization because you're optimizing, you cannot do this over all time because information gets revealed to you after you make the decision, right? You make a decision, then information gets revealed, then you can make the next decision, then information gets revealed and so forth, okay? So, the update law for the next set of prices, you know, tries to maximize revenue doing online optimization. <coughs> Standard approach for doing that is to optimize the regret or have a, what's called no regret. Okay? No regret means that compared to a strategy that I do not know, 
Okay, but fixed and optimal, how does my online algorithm behave? And what I would like to do is, because I make no uh, distribution assumption, is that I would like the regret to decay at a certain rate. You cannot decay faster than one square root of t. You try to be able to decay t is time. Uh, you want to decay roughly as one over square root of t. That's standard in no regret algorithms. Okay, so that's the bottom line of what we're trying to do. All of this stuff we can actually do. <laughs> There's no reason to get, tell you all the details of this. We can actually create um, uh, an update mechanism for the price that decays like 1 over root t, and then as a result, this particular system works. So I know I'm, I'm putting a lot of stuff under the table. So that leaves me with one question of how do you divide the revenue that you collected among the, buy the sellers? And that turns out to be another interesting question of its own, okay? So I collected a certain amount, so I allocated data for the buyer. The buyer benefited a certain amount. Based on the benefit, they paid me Myerson's payment function. I got some money, I need to pay the, the sellers, okay? So now how do I pay the sellers? Well, I need to actually do an evaluation of seeing if I took the seller in and out of the set that I allocated, one particular, I pick a seller, I want to put him in and take them out and see the incremental value they add. And based on that incremental value, they actually get allocated a certain amount of money. Okay? But actually, if you think about it, this is what? This is the Shapley value for people who studied economics. Okay? The Shapley value, but it's a little bit more than what I just described. It's not that I... I take the data from the whole set in and out. I have to take the data out of every subset in and out. That seems like a combinatorial test that I have to do. And it turns out that you can do this test algorithmically rather fast by sampling a probability distribution in the set of uh, subsets. Again, it's just a detail. Um, but this is a place where um, I want to highlight an interesting phenomenon that can happen. Um, which is where replication becomes a problem. And this is actually kind of something that we have to worry about in everything we do. So let's say that, for example, I allocate, you know, I'm the market, a buyer came, uh, comes in, I allocated two data sets to this particular buyer, <coughs> and they both contributed evenly, exactly the same, uh, to the prediction task. So they took the dollar that Say I collected a dollar from that guy, and they, this guy got half, and the other guy got a half. Then A said, oh, I'm, I know what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to appear in this system as an A prime. I am myself, the same guy. I'm going to appear as an A prime, replicate myself. And now, actually, based on the bidding method, as well as the value, now the three data sets are used, A, A prime, and B. Okay, they all have the same contribution to the data, to the prediction task. So the money gets divided by the three of them. So this guy gets one third, one third, and one third. But this is the same guy, so this guy got two thirds. And that's a, a, a thing that happens with replication. So they start to begin the system by repeating themselves in the system and, and multiplying and so forth. So we have to prevent we have to prevent these types of activities, and that opened up a whole different question of, of research of how to, how to do this. You can either argue you have to authenticate each person to be a different individual, which is a very, very complicated exercise. Um, uh, our solution to this problem was actually to do an information weighting between data sets. Okay, so you kind of like look at the information distance between these data sets and penalize everybody based on the information weighting. Again, if you read the paper that I posted online, it creates interesting uh, paradoxes, right? In the sense that every time you add an information weighting function, um, there's a trade-off between whether you can dis differentiate between data. Okay, so one, one thing I will tell you rather easily, right, is that if A and A prime were truly different data sets, then they got penalized. Right? So what happens is, in other words, this mechanism for weighing information distance penalizes data sets that are comparable to each other. Okay? And you can take this as a negative thing or you can take it as a positive thing. The positive thing is that, well, people have to 
work hard in providing data sets that are different from everybody else. If you provide data sets similar to other people, you actually do not get the value that you want to extract from this. So, okay. So, I'm going to move on because uh, I'm running out of time. So, I actually hand waved the, the whole solution to this problem because it's, it's complicated and in detail. But the bottom line is that what you have in the paper that we provided is a, an in-principle system that can implement this market, okay, in principle. I say in principle because it has a lot of issues that need to be resolved, right? The interesting thing about it is that there is a way to economically make sense of valuing data. There is a mechanism to algorithmically discover the value of data, okay, without doing any prediction, without doing, making any assumptions on distributions of what buyers are coming to buy and so forth. But then there is like a whole open set of question, uh, interesting questions of what if you had that information or what if actually you learned that information from the data that was coming. So data was coming, you start learning distributions on what the buyers are coming for. Based on these distributions, now you actually have more knowledge of what the data is doing. So how do the prices become? Where do the prices move? Do they move in a certain way? Do they converge? And so forth. Um, the final thing I wanted to mention here is that we actually have this big project in sub-Saharan Africa on digital farming, uh, which is um, really not about farming, but it's about data. So I wanted to just quickly describe that to you, um, highlight some of the interesting questions there. So one of the interesting things is that, and, and, and some of the differences of the data markets that I described. So the, the interesting question for... Uh, 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 farmers is that they're extremely poor in, uh, in, Af in sub-Saharan Africa. Yet, at the same time, they're all sitting on incredible uh, assets. I mean, they have land, and the land is capable of producing a lot, of, a lot more than they are producing with it, okay? So they, they're kind of torn, and first of all, a lot of them are not very sophisticated, so they're dictated by these distributors who take advantage of them. Um, but farmers are afraid to take any, any loans or take credit from any bank because in, in principle what they have to do, they have to mortgage their land, they mortgage their land and then they have a bad year, they lose the land. Okay? And that's, that, that's the thing they don't want to do. So they, there is an impediment to advancing themse themselves technologically but actually without that technology they cannot produce better profits. Right now they're producing, they're using old crops and they're, they're producing, you know, relatively kind of limited crops and so there's an economy that is not moving, okay? So what we're saying is, could we actually empower the, the, the farmers with their data? And, and this poses some, uh, some conflicts uh, that we have to think about. So, so what does that mean? So ideally, what I would like to do is to say, look, you know, I'm a very poor farmer, but here is my neighbor who is actually um, a richer farmer. This is a gross simplification. Uh, this particular farmer employed a lot of advanced technology. What does that mean? Sensors, irrigation, fertilizers, you name it. There's a whole bunch of things that they can do. They, bought, they, they invested, they got this technology, they produce better crops, they make 10x profit. So based on that data, I'm going to take their data now and go to the bank and say, look what I can do. This is what I can do. So if you give me a loan, we're going to base it on that asset. That's what my asset is, is equal to, not the poor asset that I've been producing for the past 10 years. Right? So that's an interesting uh, uh, twist to it. Um, of course, the bank is going to look at that and say, if we, if we can verify that, in fact, you can do the same thing, the upside of this is, is tremendous, right? So we'll invest, we'll, we'll make money, you'll make money, we're all, we're all happy people. Um, okay, so that seems like it's an easy problem. Let's collect all the data from all the farmers and let's create this market and uh, begin to extrapolate the value from this market, okay? So that's kind of the idea, this is the opportunity, is that the farmers um, would like to get the credits from the bank, but they also would like to be able to up upgrade their work, you know, their technology. So they use the money here in order to buy uh, technology in order to upgrade their, their operations. 
so let's create a data platform where we can share this data. The sharing of the data can happen on multiple things, right? So we need the farming data for sure, okay? And uh, uh, potentially even um, the banks, of course, would like to get some credit assessment, so they would like their farmer's profile. And the technology companies would like to know what the farmers are needed so that they can actually produce it. You know, so for example, a lot of the fertilizer companies, they can, they can uh, match and uh, customize the fertilizers for a particular land. So everybody is benefiting, everybody is optimizing what they're doing to the needs of, uh, of the farmer. So every, actually it's a kind of a, an economy that would be kick-started. Okay? And the outcome, of course, would be all recommendations in the right direction. Okay, this is similar to the problem that I described before. Uh, it has um, actually um, kind of this matrix completion problem, call it tensor completion problem because we have a time component to all of this. So you can think of, uh, sorry. Uh, so one axis I have all the farms, and another axis I have all the interventions, and I have a time axis of what has happened with these interventions. I have a bunch of, um, uh, maybe here, metrics in terms of uh, how much more revenue we generated, maybe incremental revenue that we generated, or incremental economic value that has been created, and so forth. And then based on that, we want to figure out how do I, what if I use this intervention for this farm at that time, how does it actually behave in the future? So we want to do the matrix, com the, the tensor completion. It's a much sparser data set than actually Netflix. But at the same time, it has time component to it. The time can allow you to get better correlation. Of course, part of the technology that we're doing is building ways in which we can do these tensor completion problems, which is an interesting um, inference problem on its own, which I'm not talking about over here. Okay? Uh, in principle, this is kind of like a multi-arm bandit problem uh, with sparse data. Okay? Um, the, but the interesting question, though, is, um, and, and this is just to kind of leave you with a thought. Um, coming back to this market over here, why should the farmers uh, share their data? Why should a farmer that has actually been very successful, and, you know, employed good technology, produced very good crops, expensive crops, why should they share the data with a poorer farmer? That farmer becomes their competitors. They compete in the auxiliary market where they sell crops. And then, you know, if I if I use some intelligent methods and I produce a lot of tomatoes, I'm the only person who produces. Why would I get somebody else to produce tomatoes? Okay. So I will share the data. So what you're saying, I will share the data if I get revenue from the data that I sold. Right, and that's, I think, the critical point. I will share the data if you reward me well for the data that I gave, and that would be extra revenue for me. But what is rewarding me well for this data? There is the, the, the negative of losing money at the competition in the market, and there is a positive that you may pay me for the data set based on your extrapolated value. And the question is, how do I fuse the two together? Hmm? So, the, so, um, um, well, the recommendation, no, the recommend maybe the recommendations can actually allow things to balance, um, which is possible that there is an auxiliary recommendation system that says, okay, you should produce tomatoes and you should produce olives and you should produce this and that and so forth, right? But the point I was trying to get to is that the difficulty in creating data sharing markets different than what I talked about before is that this has the auxiliary competition that we worry about. The, the effects of sharing the data has implication on the buyer and the seller at the same time. While in the formulation I gave you earlier, seller, and I kept emphasizing seller, doesn't care about what the buyer does with the data, does not care about the buyer at all, is not invested in the buyer, doesn't compete with the buyer, doesn't have any, any relationship to the buyer. Data sharing markets are exactly the opposite. Buy the, the companies or the players are both buyers and sellers. They are invested in the outcome of the prediction. They're all doing the same types of prediction. They're all invested in the outcome. In this particular case, they're all competing in an auxiliary market. 
Okay? And so this actually poses more complication in creating a, a, a system, which we're, we have some idea, but you know, uh, uh, and we're working on it. Interesting thing about this is that you have to now view data as capital. The same way you invest capital in a land or in a, in a house or in somebody's uh, business and require returns from it, you have to view valuable data as capital in the same way, producing returns the same way capital produces a return. This is completely like out of the box for these uh, players, particularly when you talk about farmers who don't even understand what data is all about. In many, actually, commodity markets of people competing, the idea that you're going to sell data the same way you sell capital <coughs> or you share data the same way you share capital is completely out of the box. So we're finding a lot of resistance in those communities to figuring out how to how to incentivize the sharing of the data. The only way, I think maybe kind of coming back to your comment, is that farmers are willing to share some data, they share some data, if it, you know, so they can share maybe some data about the soil and the type of soil they have, they get recommendations of how to improve that. But they're not sharing the data where, where profit has been generated. We're almost like in a, in a very parallel situation as financial companies. Why financial companies don't sh share their data? Because that's how they make money. And they know that their data is equivalent to money, so they don't share the data, right? It's the same thing that we're seeing in these types of markets. At the same time, in order to kind of do this economic reform, you almost have to utilize uh, uh, kind of this preferential data or the data that is about other people. And so this big project that we have is really trying to kind of make a dent in the economic structure um, and we're working with the, well, we're working with large uh, fertilizer companies, but also we're working with the World Bank and so forth. So there's in, at least a little bit of investment and a little bit of profit that can help in creating these data sharing markets. But it is a, a kind of a, a challenge, not just from a mathematical point of view, but also from an adoption point of view. So that that's work that is ongoing. So uh, that's my spiel about data market. I didn't even get to the second talk. Um, so I, what I was going to tell you about the second set of view graphs is really um, important because also you, you're interested in energy systems and so I'm going to say a few words about that. So one thing that is interesting about, so I think it's clear that data is critical. We have to gather the data and we have to figure out how to monetize it and so forth. But at some point we also have to start building models from these data. And what is actually emerging in all the examples that I described to you is that um, the, where the data is not really structured, okay? It comes from models that are not necessarily physical models or maybe a combination of physical and non-physical models. The underlying, see, if, if, you're, if you're designing a control system for an airplane, for example, I mean, there's some intuition about the airplane that will tell you how many modes you have to take in order to capture a really good and accurate model. I mean, you know, um, uh, you, can, you can always say that you can design the first control system by assuming that the airplane is a double integrator and then build more and more around it. But in these types of systems where you're talking about a very large number of consumers, an unknown number of types of people, how do you begin to build these models? And so this is... The, the space of high dimensional statistics, okay? That you have data sets from extremely large, I mean, large data sets, that, that's not a big deal that you have a large data set, but the size of the model is probably comparable to the size of the data. That's where it's a big deal, right? And think about network models is one example of that, right? So, you know, network would be a million nodes, and on each node you have a measurement that's a million measurements. You add a node, it becomes a million and one, million and one measurements, but a million and one nodes, right? So every time you add a node, you add a measurement. The size of the model and the size of the data are comparable, right? And so building, understanding what you can build is really complicated. This is also true for dynamical systems, you know? In other words, what we have is, for example, we're looking at uh, maybe incentive design, we're looking at a large number of consumers, Maybe each consumer has their own dynamics, or maybe there is a, an underlying lower dimensional system that governs this behavior, but we don't know a priori what that looks like. 
Right now, every person that we measure a data set about, whether it's about demand response or incentive mechanism, is a node on this particular graph. Okay? And so the dimension of these systems are very, very large, right? And the underlying model a priori doesn't have a lower dimensional. We know it may be lower dimensional, but we don't know where it comes from. So, so in linear system theory, this is a, a sort of an in, a interesting question in that if, if you have a system that is generated, you know, by maybe, maybe noisy data, okay? So it looks like this. And you have observations of inputs and outputs, and you want to learn G. But now, here's the scenario. You don't know anything about G except that it's stable. So the dimension of G could be very, very large, right? So it corresponds to these types of behavior that I described, coming from people, they're responding to incentives, there's 10 million people out there, and for all you know, there are 10 million different behaviors in that system you don't know. Right? So there are no knowledge, no, you know it's stable, right? You know it's stable, that means that uh, um, the impressed response is in L1, but otherwise you don't know anything about it. So how do you learn a system like this? Can you learn a system that you don't have any prior information about? Can you learn the system? So I get the step response. I get the step response. That's all I get. If you put the step response, I get the step response. Hmm? You can put feedback. I'm asking, can you learn G with high accuracy? No, you observe Y. You observe U and Y. No, they, they, okay, so you have a... So this is a dynamical system, right? And you have a sequence of U of T y of t for t less than or equal to capital T. That's the data set, and the data characterized by time t. Can I learn the system with high accuracy? Maybe. You tell me. You tell me how accurate can you learn the system? Uh, okay, any accuracy, any guaranteed bound. But I mean, can you give me a scenario where you can learn a system with high accuracy? I guess that the net would be the same. Yeah. So I, I want to know, right? So remember, this is. Is everyone familiar with linear time invariant system? Yeah, okay. So you know how this works, right? It's a convolution operator. There's, a, there's an L1 function, right? And so you write this as y of t is the convolution of g and u of t plus noise, right? This g is unknown. It's an infinite sequence. This, think of it as discrete time. It's an infinite sequence. The only thing you know about it is that it decays. It's an L1. Okay? Can you actually learn the system? I claim you cannot learn anything about the system. That's, that's what I was looking for. Somebody say nothing. You can learn nothing about the system. Why is it that you cannot learn anything about the system? Because I can, I can think of a system where it has T delays over here. It starts kicking in after the time you stopped reading data. I mean, it made no assumptions in the system, right? And so all you've seen is noise. Okay, and then the actual system starts kicking in after time t. I mean, that's a trivial example, but what I'm saying, make no assumptions, you get nothing. That's really important, yes. Okay, g... Okay, g is an L, g is an L1 sequence. It's a black box. You are making observations, inputs and outputs. But it's a linear time invariant system, so it has a lot of structure to it. Um, it's not arbitrary. 
every output is generated through the convolution of the same number, the same type of coefficients. It's not arbitrary, right? And we we do. How many of you have taken a class in system identification? Two. Okay. How about like regression? Okay. Okay. All right. So you know, I have to come back again to uh, Copenhagen to this, give this lecture. But um, um, uh, so the point is this, right? You know, if you if I said to you that this is a sequence in RT, and it works like convolution, okay, then you can learn it, and you can learn it with arbitrary accuracy. But not necessarily the same T. Okay? Why? Because you can write this as a regression problem, right? You can write every output as some convolution times the input. You get this toplets matrix multiplying U plus noise, and you learn the toplets matrix. And you can learn it with arbitrary accuracy. Okay, if I don't tell you anything about where it belongs, the other extreme, you can't learn anything. I gave you a counter example of how you cannot learn anything. So my question is, suppose I made no assumptions, and I made no assumptions, is it possible that you learn something? Something. I mean, you got some data. You're going to be able to learn something. So my question is, what is it that you learn? You gotta learn something. You got a data set. You get a mapping. What is that mapping? What kind of what kind of what is it that you learned? This, no, but the system I told you, you you're not guaranteed to learn the system up to time t. Okay, so that's the so I'm gonna tell you what the answer is. An answer is. You're learning some lower dimensional approximation of the system. Sometimes that lower dimensional approximation is one dimension, depending on the data. But every data set provides you some lower dimensional approximation. So, so the picture is, right, original system G, right, and maybe it has lower dimensional approximation GK. Okay, those are unknown to you. G you don't know, and as a result, you can write down all the possible lower dimensional approximation. There's a beautiful model approximation theory in system theory based on Hankel matrices. Okay, if you don't know that, Google that, you should know it. Okay, because that's, like, there are very rare uh, results that are close form and beautiful, and this is one of them, okay, where, you know, you can construct exactly the kth dimensional approximation to G, right? But now all I have is the data set, ZT, okay? And I'm trying to learn something from this. So what can I learn? And the point is, I can always learn some GK hat for some K based on T. There's a K that depends on T. I can always learn that that will approximate this guy over here. The k-dimensional approximation. This turns out to be sort of the analog of linear system theory to a lot of spectral methods that are used in machine learning and uh, and so forth. It's tensor analysis or tensor approximation. It's captured in this matrix approximation problem over here in linear system theory. So the notes that you have the slides captured this particular problem over here, um, and I sent you the paper. Uh, uh, on that particular topic, but it, in terms of what you need to learn to actually do this right, you should learn how to do this approximation for LTI systems at this level over here, and then the rest is in the paper. Anyway, so that's the, so this is motivating uh, looking at spectral methods for very, very high dimensional linear systems, and in particular, very high dimensional jump linear systems, stochastic systems, where the transition probabilities uh, with the transition matrix is a probabilistic matrix that takes a value within, say, a distribution. Uh, and you can sort of do all of this stuff, but, um, you know, in, in talking about what is learnable and to what level of approximation this is learnable, relying very much on what we call the Hankel structure of a, a, a linear time invariant system. So that's a, a sequence of work that I would have liked to talk about, but I think I'm preventing you from going to lunch. Okay, and thank you. Sorry for uh, running. Thank you. I didn't understand that if there's a, a, a 
incentive for the buyers and the model to, uh, to use the best possible method for, for the prediction Okay, okay, uh, in, the, in the data market. In the data market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so right now the way, so I didn't get into a lot of the, these details, but the um, buyer and the market will agree on what prediction task to use, what algorithm. In fact, the buyer can provide the market with the algorithm to compute. The other point that I didn't make, because we didn't talk about this enough, is that actually the market never gives the data to the buyer. The market computes the, the estimate. The buyer can provide the market with the algorithm if they like, but the market computes. Market, so the seller doesn't give the data. So ultimately, the seller's data can be sold again and cannot become the ownership of the buyer who can then go around and sell it. Yeah. 